Welcome to this video lecture series on the fundamentals of conservative political thought. The objective of this set of lectures is to help conservatives understand why they believe what they believe and why progressives believe what they believe. This video investigates the opposing views that conservatives and progressives have on human nature. This video on human nature is the first in a six-part series. Other videos will include a look at the definition of what is good and what is bad, differing visions for society, why there is a need for control on the side of the progressives, and lastly, a look at my personal values and how they are involved in developing program fundamentals. This lecture is divided into three parts. First, the introduction to the topic. Second, the brain, the hardware of human nature. And third, the mind, the software that runs on the hardware and determines our nature. Our first step is to define what we are talking about. Human nature, what is it? I found two definitions which I found interesting. The first one, the general psychological characteristics, feelings, and behavioral traits of humankind regarded as shared by all humans. The second, the distinguishing characteristics, including ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that humans tend to have naturally independent of the influence of culture. So, how do progressives and conservatives differ on the topic of human nature? The progressives believe that man is born with a blank slate, that we are malleable. They embrace the perfectibility of man. We conservatives, on the other hand, we reject the idea of perfectibility. We are born with an innate nature, which is flawed. We accept it and we work to overcome it. We are all very familiar with the nature versus nurture debate that has been going on for the past few decades. Human nature is what the debate is about. How much of our nature is determined by society and our experiences, and how much of it is determined by our biology, and how much of our nature can we change? So what side are you on? Are you a noble savage? In this chart, we can start to understand why it is so difficult for us to agree on something such as human nature. There are numerous schools of philosophical thought, as well as numerous psychological theories about what constitutes human nature. If we are interested in digging deeper into what divides conservatives and progressives, look into the traditionalist and romantic schools of thought. The romantics believe that man is born good, but that society corrupts man, and therefore man needs to be protected from society by a strong government. Conservatives, on the other hand, believe in the traditionalist philosophy, which says that man is born bad, but wants to be good. Conservatives fear a powerful government made up of flawed individuals who get corrupted by power. The use of the subjective terms good and bad might be disturbing to some people, no one wants to consider themselves as bad. What is good and what is bad? Is bad evil? This topic will be discussed in detail in the second video in this series. For now though, I will use the term good to define as a high level of altruism, selflessness, and bad as a high level of selfishness. These are progressive definitions. I am not quite certain that selfishness placing a priority on one's own survival and success is a bad thing. Understanding human nature is critical because it defines the current state of society. Anyone who wants to create a roadmap for improving our social, economic, and political reality will need to have an understanding of both the end state, where we want to be, and the current state. Steps in developing a roadmap include, one, to develop a clear and unambiguous understanding of the current state. To develop a roadmap, we first need to have a clear and unambiguous understanding of the current state. 
we then define the desired end state. Third, we conduct a gap analysis exercise based on where we are and where we want to be. And then we prioritize the findings from the gap analysis exercise into a series of gap closure strategies. We try to find the optimum sequence of actions recognizing predecessor-successor relationships, and then we develop and publish and implement the roadmap. How do you do a proper gap analysis if you do not have an accurate understanding of the current state? The resulting roadmap will be at best useless and at worst harmful. What are the real world ramifications of this debate? Using a simple flowchart, we can determine where the differing viewpoints will lead us politically. The first question to answer is, can man become perfect? If we answer no, we arrive at the conservative philosophy of imperfectibility. We accept ourselves for what we are, and we develop a strong set of laws to protect us from the human frailties in others. We realize that utopia, a perfect society, is not possible and not a realistic objective. We tolerate an imperfect society. If we believe that man can become perfect, then we proceed to the next question. Can man become perfect on his own? If we answer yes, then we leave man alone to become perfect, eventually and naturally. If we answer no, then we arrive at the progressive philosophy which has a goal of guiding mankind to perfection via education and social control for his own good. With the right type of education and control, a new man ready to create utopia is possible. Progressives believe so passionately in utopia that even when faced with a century worth of failed socialist experiments that did quite the opposite of create a utopia, Progressives rationalize that the failures were due to flawed leadership and not to flawed ambitions and objectives. Utopia. Is it possible or not? Conservatives believe that utopia is not possible because man is not perfect nor perfectible. Conservatives feel that any attempt at social control and re-education, even though for a good, worthy goal, is a bad thing for the liberty of the people. Where do you stand? How perfect are you? How perfect do you think you can become? Do you think that utopia, a society of perfect equality where equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity is desirable or possible? Is liberty possible in utopia? Which is more important, utopia or liberty? What are you willing to sacrifice for utopia? Our first step in the investigation will be to look at the hardware which might create human nature, the brain. Many progressives believe that there is no such thing as human nature, that we are born with a blank slate and that our nature is malleable. Because we are malleable, the theory goes, with the right type of education and control, the social engineers can turn us into a new man ready for utopia. I have no idea how to prove that human nature does not exist. How do you prove a negative? So I'll focus on showing reasons why I believe that human nature does exist. If you don't believe me, then you can assume that human nature does not exist, or just that my proof was not good enough. By the way, that's Russell's teapot orbiting the sun. Let me start with an example that virtually everyone has experienced. Does anyone that has had a baby honestly think that babies are born empty? From birth, as soon as babies get muscle control, they are little social beings. Have you ever seen a newborn interact with its mother? How about two young babies playing together? Where do these social skills come from? Are all babies alike? It's clearly evident that babies just a few months old have individual personalities. How do these individual personalities develop at such a young age? When we look at the animal kingdom, we see newborns walk within minutes of being born. They know how to suckle for nourishment. 
A baby bison knows that a wolf is not a friend. A baby dolphin knows not to breathe underwater. Well, in these examples, one might say that the mother guides or teaches the newborn somehow. So let's look at the sea turtle. Sea turtles know instinctively that if they want to survive, they have to get into the ocean as fast as possible. There is an instinctual attraction to go towards the sound of waves and to get into the ocean. And then the sea turtle knows how to swim within minutes of hatching. Where does this knowledge come from? About 150 years ago, the concept of genetic memory was proposed and has not yet been discredited. Genetic memory is a memory present at birth that exists in the absence of sensory experience. That is, the memories are not created from experiences we have. The genetic memory could be like the BIOS, the basic input-output system of a computer that helps to load the operating system of the computer when you turn it on. Genetic memories, according to the theories, are based on the common experiences of the species and incorporated into the genome over long spans of time. Genetic memory is used to explain the racial memory, the collective unconscious, postulated by Carl Jung. In Jungian psychology, Racial memories are memories, feelings, and ideas inherited from our ancestors as part of a collective unconscious. We are individuals with our own psyche, our own consciousness, our own subconscious and unconscious minds, but we are like icebergs being carried together by the currents in the ocean of the collective unconscious. Some modern scientific investigations show that genetic memory might even affect us over generational timescales. That something that happened to your great-grandfather might have a subtle effect on you today. Where, or when, did our genetic memory, our racial collective consciousness, develop? About two million years ago, the genus Homo appeared. Homo is Greek for man. Two million years ago, Homo habilis appeared, and evolved for about a million years. Homo erectus followed and evolved over the next 750,000 years. 250,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, sentient man, arrived. The greatest achievements in the evolution of the Homo genus was the brain. We have two million years of brain development behind us. It is this two million years that makes us who we are today. Over the two million years, brain size grew from about 600 cubic centimeters, more than doubling to about 1300 cubic centimeters today. A large part of the development of the brain occurred in Homo erectus, the predecessor of Homo sapiens. The vast majority of the development being in the neocortex, the part of the brain that makes us who we are as humans. Note, while we do know from skeletal records the size of Paleolithic man's brains, we do not know anything about the complexity of their brains. Now let's put the timeline of human evolution into some perspective. We've been evolving for about two million years. Two million years we've been living as hunter-gatherers. 40,000 years ago, we had the behavioral great leap forward with a subsequent shift from the hunter-gatherer to the agricultural way of living about 10,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, we started getting civilized. 3,000 years ago, we started thinking deep thoughts. The time span of human civilization is but a blink of an eye in evolutionary time scales. Now let's look at the development of the brain itself. In the 1960s, neuroscientist Paul McLean developed the concept of the triune, three-part brain. The main idea is that new parts of the brain developed on top of the old parts, and that the old parts did not disappear. The old parts still serve the same function they did when they originally developed. 
The core of the human brain is the reptilian brain, which reached full development about 250 million years ago. This is the primitive part of the brain that is responsible for dominance, territoriality, and aggression. It is also the part that reacts in the split-second fight-or-flight instinct, which we are all very familiar with. As mammals evolved, about 150 million years ago, the limbic system, also known as the mammalian brain, started to grow on top of the reptilian brain. While the reptilian brain reacts to danger, the mammalian brain tries to anticipate danger. It is also hypothesized to play a role in emotions and maybe even risk and reward judgments. About three million years ago, the most complicated part of the brain, the neocortex, started to grow. The neocortex is the part that makes us who we are, the part that makes us sentient. It is responsible for intellectual tasks, and social interactions and culture. The evolution of the neocortex and sentience does not mean that the reptilian and mammalian parts of the brain disappeared, or even that the neocortex is the dominant controller of the brain. The reptilian and mammalian brains are still there and speculated to be quite active in the processing that goes on in our heads. The reptilian and mammalian brains might be a part of what is termed the gray brain, the subconscious, the unconscious, while the neocortex is the white brain, the conscious brain. According to some theories, the gray brain might be responsible for the vast majority of our psyche. A brain has a purpose. There's a reason that the human body allocates 20% of the daily calories to the brain, the purpose is to help the being and the species survive and thrive. If we compare the gray brain and the white brain that we just spoke about to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the gray brain is responsible for our survival needs, those being the physiological and safety issues, while the white brain helps us thrive. To thrive, in human terms, includes our social interactions, social acceptance, esteem, and ultimately when all other needs are met, our self-actualization. In the hierarchy of the triune brain, the neocortex is not always dominant. The reptilian brain reacts much faster to external stimuli than does the neocortex, about as fast as 30 milliseconds compared to 500 milliseconds for the neocortex. How often have you reacted to external stimuli automatically, then had a feeling, and then finally the conscious brain wonders what just happened and why do I feel like this? Now think about how often you get a feeling, an emotion, an internal stimulus, followed by analysis, followed by action. How often have you acted on a feeling without thinking? To act rashly, is to act without a reasonable amount of consideration. Acting rashly is letting the mammalian and reptilian parts of the brain make decisions for you. In about 380 BC, Plato developed the concept of the tripartite soul. Was he observing the outward actions of a brain that he could not see? Plato said that man is both noble and ignoble at the same time. The appetites, the base desires and drives of man, identified with the belly and the genitals, were the ignoble part of human nature. Our spiritedness was the noble part, the hot blood in our hearts that motivates us to go out and do something. The mind is the rational part that keeps the spiritedness and the appetites under control and guides them in a desired direction. Plato used the allegory of the chariot to explain the notion of the tripartite soul. The spiritedness was like the white horse pulling in one direction, and the appetites being the black horse pulling in their own direction. If either horse got too strong or stumbled, the chariot would go in a less than desirable direction. The job of the charioteer was to keep the horses in sync so that the chariot went in a straight line in the direction of the desired destination. 
In the 1920s, Sigmund Freud developed his three-part model of the human psyche. And again, there was conflict between the three parts. The primary part of the human psyche is the id. It is the primal desires. It's your wild child. It's the part of you that wants to have it now. The ego is the reason, the self-control. It is the grown-up self. It is the part that says that I need to make a plan. The superego, on the other hand, is the internalized ideals. It's the quest for perfection. It is philosophy. It's the part of you that says you can't have it because it is not right. Wrapping up with evolution, putting everything into context. For two million years, we lived a harsh lifestyle where survival meant you either killed and ate or you were killed and eaten. Resources were scarce. The smartest and fittest survived. That is evolution. Survival of your clan being prioritized over the survival of someone else's clan. That is the genetic memory that we are based on. That is what our brain was evolved to do. Paleolithic man, though, was not a solitary man. Paleolithic man cooperated to survive. While gathering was an easy solitary endeavor, hunting depended on the success of small groups. And those small groups eventually evolved into society. I took a DNA test and I found out that I am 2.9% Neanderthal genetically. The average for Europeans is about 2.5%. I am one standard deviation away from the norm in the 84th percentile. So what does that mean for who I am? How much of a caveman is left in the bios of my nature? Paleolithic man was more testosterone fueled, was more aggressive, more competitive, more promiscuous than modern man. I'm thinking now that the internal conflict that I suffer, maybe it's not a struggle between good and evil, which are subjective terms, but a conflict between my inner caveman and my modern self. Back to the debate about good versus bad. Is the reptilian part of my brain the bad part of my brain? The only motivation for the reptilian brain is my survival. What is in it for me? That's all the reptilian brain thinks. Selfishness is survival. The reptilian brain does not think. It is not interested in fairness. It is ruled by hunger and fear, fight or flight, and some fight too often. Isn't this what some define as bad? But again, how can something that helps you survive be bad? Our human nature, based on a genetic memory of kill or be killed, is starting to look pretty grim. How do we survive as a social species? We can't kill everybody. Don't despair. There is a balance in the brain. As our social groups grew larger and more important, our brains evolved a way to help the group survive more effectively. Structures called mirror neurons evolved. The role of mirror neurons is to counter the selfishness of the reptilian brain. Mirror neurons are responsible for empathy, which is the basis for social relations. Empathy and altruism, which are seen as good things. Mirror neurons fire when an action is observed, giving an internal representation of that action. We feel as though we have experienced the physical action. This is what empathy is based on. We see the emotional cues in others and we feel their emotions. This is why we feel bad when someone else feels bad and we try to help them feel better. Empathy might be a little bit selfish. We ourselves do not like to feel bad. So by helping somebody else feel better, we feel better. The guys listening to this lecture might think that their mirror neurons are not working as well as those of their female friends. Guys are not the most emotionally attuned sometimes. But fear not, your mirror neurons are working. Think about what happens when you're watching sports. The sense of the excitement of the game you feel even when watching it on TV. 
those are your mirror neurons reacting to the action on the playing field. Men get a rush just by watching somebody else do something. Interesting, isn't it? We have a self-balancing set of hardware. We are both selfish and we are empathic. There are some things that we are not supposed to talk about because they're politically incorrect. But if there is a hardware component to human nature, and there is such a thing as genetic memory, then I must venture into the territory of political incorrectness. We conservatives believe in freedom of thought and speech. While it might be politically incorrect to draw correlations between genetics and human behaviors and capabilities, it is not illegal, for now. So here we go. The map that you see shows differences in how European national cultures differ on the value of individualism. The darker the blue, the more individualist, the darker the red, the more collectivist. It goes without saying that this does not imply that everyone in a given society is programmed in the same way. There are considerable differences between individuals. The map was created using Geert Hofstede's scale of individualism versus collectivism. The fundamental issue addressed by this dimension is the degree of interdependence a society maintains among its members. It has to do with whether people's self-image is defined in terms of I or we. Individualists are motivated by self-improvement, their own ego, rather than by the approval or respect from others. Collectivists, on the other hand, are people that care more about personal ties, belonging to a group, feeling accepted and respected within that group, and they tend to be more clannish and distrust people from outside their own group. Collectivists are first and foremost approval seekers who care about their image and what others think of them. There are two other interesting characteristics in Hofstede's analysis. The first, masculinity. This shows how competitive the natural culture is. A high score, or masculine, indicates that the society will be driven by competition, achievement, and success, with success being defined by the winner or best in class. A low score, or feminine, means that the dominant values in society are caring for others and quality of life. Standing out from the crowd is not admirable in a feminine society. The second characteristic is power distance. This dimension deals with the fact that individuals in societies are not equal. It expresses the attitude of the culture towards these inequalities amongst us. Power distance indicates the extent to which the less powerful members of institutions and organizations within a country expect and accept that power is distributed unequally. There's been some speculation that there might be a correlation between the individualism trait and haplogroup genetic groups. Now, take a look at this map and see which nations have a propensity towards individualism and which ones towards collectivism. Over the last two decades, there's been a large amount of genetic testing and analysis done. We can now see how concentrations of genetic types differ by regions. Here we have two genetic groups, the R1B subclass U106 and the group I2A2, which have an interesting correlation to regions where individualism is valued. Now take a look at genetic groups I2A1 and R1A. It's curious that these are centered on areas where collectivism is more valued. I am an R1A1A from Croatia. According to my genetic type, I should be more collectivist but I am far from collectivist because I stand for equality, liberty, and individualism. Could this be because I was raised in Canada, which values individualism far more than does Croatia? Something interesting to think about, because now I say that nurture overcomes nature. When we look at the colonization of the Americas, 
these correlations get even more interesting. We can see that there are clear differences today between English-speaking North America and Spanish-speaking Central and South America. Portugal, one of the most collectivist of the colonial nations, left its value system in Brazil. To this day, Brazil is very high on the socialism scale. Now look at Argentina, which is probably the most European, the most diversified country in South America, with a very large Italian and German influence. At the start of the 1900s, Argentina had a lot of potential for economic growth and to be a free society. But then, something happened. What? I better stop talking about this before the uh, thought police come storming through my door. I don't know if there is any truth to this, if there is any type of correlation between genetics and, let's say, conservatism, which would be a high individualism plus high masculinity plus low power distance. But I do look forward to new research into this topic. And that is a short introduction to the nature component of human nature. You learned a little bit about two million years of brain evolution, babies with personalities, genetic memory, mirror neurons, the triune brain, genetics and cultural values, Jung's collective unconscious, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what does your gut feel on the issue? Is there a nurture component to human nature that we are born with? And now for a bit of a bonus, just like the extras on a Blu-ray. Do you think that you are any smarter than one of Socrates' students that lived in Athens 2,420 years ago? Do you understand what Socrates spoke about? Over the last 3,000 years, have we evolved intellectually or morally? Look back at the great thinkers such as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They developed some of the foundational ideas of philosophy and morality. But today, we still suffer from some of the same moral problems that humanity suffered back then. We know more about the material world, but what do we know about the inner world? About 2,500 years later, how many people understand the great thoughts of Socrates or Confucius? Our behaviors changed when we got civilized. But how much has our hardware changed in the last 40,000 years since the Great Leap Forward? How much has the brain changed in the 25,000 years since early man made the first huts for mammoth bones and skins in the area of the Czech Republic? Is 10,000 years of agricultural life enough time to result in any evolutionary change in the hardware of the brain? In the Stone Age, we used fire and stone tools. Today, we have the internet and the iPhone. But how different is the hardware of our brains? I consider myself a little bit cynical, but I'm not the first cynic. In the 1800s, Edgar Allan Poe said, I have no faith in human perfectibility. I think that human exertion will have no appreciable effect on humanity. Man is now only more active, not more happy, nor more wise than he was 6,000 years ago. Final word. So if our intellectual horsepower is no greater than it was 6,000 years ago, how can we expect to solve terribly complex problems that have thousands upon thousands of variables? These are problems that involve society and the economy. If we are imperfect, if our processing skills are imperfect and our data set is not complete, that is, that we don't know everything, how can we find the perfect solution? That is why we conservatives are skeptical and suspicious of progressive pie-in-the-sky ambitions and solutions which we fear will ultimately fail, and the failure causing even greater problems. That is why we conservatives prefer slow and natural evolution over rapid design and reorganization. This concludes our discussion of the nature component of human nature. In the next part, we will discuss the thoughts on the nurture aspect of human nature.